Welcome to our webinar on factory acceptance test with detailed pass and fail criteria. My name is Hakan Sehin and I'll be presenting the, our slides today and talking about the testing of transformers, mostly power transformers. As always, before we do anything, I want to have a safety moment as we are getting ready for the summertime. I wanted to remind everybody about the uh, heat the hot temperatures. Most importantly, that we all need to remember to continuously drinking water and resting and finding some shade when it's too hot outside. What's the agenda today? First, we're gonna be talking about what are routine, design, and other tests defined by IEEE standards and lists of factory acceptance tests with their pass and fail criteria and during when I speak about these tests, I will actually share with you some of the case study experiences that I have had in my career. One thing that I want to mention here, as, as I completed my presentation the other day, I realized that we may not be able to complete all 42 slides today. I don't wanna rush it and really good information in here. So to respect everybody's time, we're gonna go through each slide talk about the things and most likely we will have a part two of this in middle of July where we will complete the rest of the slides and also allow more Q&A time at the end. So we'll see how that goes. As always, another reminder from our company that uh, at the end of this uh, presentations, we will give you an email address and for those of you who wants to obtain CUEs, please email uh, your request for a copy of this presentation and also certificate uh, of completion of this uh, webinar, and you can take it to your local representatives. And also, uh, our team here has uploaded the PDF version of this presentation into the webinar's website that you are in right now where you can download it and, and if for some reason you cannot see the screen clearly or whatnot, you can actually follow through the, the, the PDF file in front of you. Having said that, let's get started on testing of transforms. Uh, during my last webinar that I did back in uh, April, uh, I talked a lot about, it was really the, 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 the standards, applicable standards, and I went through all IEEE standards that we use not all, maybe most of them, and how we group those standards. Today, we're going to be really focusing on C57-1200 and C57-1290. I put C57-1291 here is for dry type distribution and power transformers, the test code for that, uh, those types of transformers. <clears throat> Why am I going to be really going back and forth 1200 and 1290? Because for those of you who are familiar with really understanding 1200 and 1290, uh, they talk to each other when it comes to testing power transformers. So I have the sections from there. We're gonna be looking at them and understand the required tests. So why am I gonna start with total losses, reference temperature for losses first? In case if you haven't uh, uh, been addressed before that uh, Standard reference temperature for load loss of power and distribution transformers shall be defined as 20 degrees C, plus the rated average winding rise. So if the transformer you are purchasing or you're using says the average winding rise is 65 degrees, the losses that we report to you has to be reported at 85 degrees. And of course, when we get to the hotspot rises, <clears throat> Uh, I will speak about the hotspot rise to be 85 or 90 or whatever your specifications call for, but also what the IEEE standards define for that. So I wanted to start with that because temperature rise of a transformer, the average temperature during the operation is, is one of the critical things and, and used for several tests and test reporting that all, all, all manufacturers has to follow. Insulation levels of and class of transformers. 
it's important for us, for all of us to really understand the class because the routine or design or other tests really goes with the class of the transformer. What is an insulation level? The transformer shall be designed to provide coordinated low frequency and impulse insulation levels on line terminals and low frequency insulation levels on neutral terminals. And from that, the set of coordinated levels shall be its maximum system voltage. So once you define the maximum system voltage of the transformer, the tables that I'm going to share with you coming up shortly defines the basic lining impulse insulation level, the BIL, of the transformer. So then when we talk about the lightning impulse test, when we talk about applied potential test or induced potential test, we will all be dealing with the BIL or the transformer. So I wanted to start with defining and understanding the class of the transformer before I just jump into here's the impulse test, this is the BIL, this is how you do it and all that stuff. So C57-1200, I would like every one of you to really pay attention to here because as I go through my slides, some of them you will see that it's from C57-1200. Some of them you will see that it will be from C57-1290. I did that purposely so that it's clear for all of us to really see where this information is stored in the IEEE standards. So let's read and understand what class applies to transforms. Class one power transformers are any that are not categorized as class two. So to understand what class one is, we got to understand class two. So let's look at class two. Class two power transformers shall include power transformers with high voltage windings rated 115 kV nominal system and above. Now, this is the latest revision of C57-1200. Those of you who are familiar with it, will probably agree with me that this sentence used to be the only sentence. Back in the days, we would say anything above 69 kV is class two. That was it. But in the Transformers Committee, we changed that. And this release, 2021 release, now has more definition to what class two. So let's read that. It says right here, and also, power transformers with high voltage windings rated 69 kV through 115 kV, nominal system voltage having a top nameplate rating at least 15 MEA for three phase transformers or 10 MEA for single phase transformers. So what that means is if you're specifying a 69 kV 25 MEA unit until 2021 release, it was considered class one. With the latest release, now that transformer is considered class two. Why is that important? What, what, what difference does it make to just put a name on a transformer? A lot. If nothing else, from testing perspectives, that is going to define what's going to be, what tests need to be performed on your transformer as routine. So we shall do those tests, regardless if you ask for it or not. And what tests are designed to be defined to be design tests? It all goes with the class of the transformer. And also class of the transformer in the tables, those of you who have copies of these standards will see in tables three, four, and five, defines the low frequency test levels per classes. Dielectric insulation levels and high frequency test levels all are defined by the class of the transformer, which is why I thought it is very important for me to start this presentation by really clearly explaining the classes of the transformers. I know it's hard to read, but as I always do, the way I put together my presentations is really for you to get a copy of it. Listen to me during the webinar so that I explain things and after the webinar, that way it will be easier for you to read through these and then and, and understand how to read these tables or any type of information. Starting from what is table three, dielectric insulation levels for distribution and class one power transformers, voltages in KV. 
So this table gives us this group here is for distribution transformers, and this group is the class one power transformers. So maximum system voltage, nominal system voltage, and now let's look at here. It says applied voltage test. Some of you call it high pot test. Okay. So this table defines the level that we need to do the applied voltage test on the transformer depending on the class and depending on the nominal system voltage of the transformer. So let's take 46 kV as an example, nominal system voltage. Okay. If it is distribution transformer, the applied potential for the delta needs to be 95 kV. The same thing for power. But the BIL levels will be winding line and BIL 200 and 250. You may not be able to see it that clearly on this TV screen, but 250 is actually in bold. What that means is that is actually the recommended. Okay? This is the minimum. And the same thing here. However, different nominal uh, system voltages will have different levels, as you can see on these tables. So now let's go to class two, insulation and test levels for class two. Okay, let's remember what class two is 115 kV and above, and also 69 kV through 115 kV, minimum 15 MVA transforms. Okay, so in this, same thing. This column defines the nominal system voltage and the maximum system voltage. And the applied voltage test, why are there three groups on the applied voltage? You can have delta, fully insulated Y. Okay? So if your transformer, let's say the high side is delta connected, the applied potential test level for your cluster transformer is defined in this table. As an example, if you purchase a 115 kV unit right here, for the high side, the applied potential test level is. 173. Okay? Grounded Y. The applied potential level is 34 kV. So you could be purchasing a 115 kV Y connected high side and you wanted your neutral to be fully grounded, then the applied level can only be 34 kV. Why is that? Yes, I will be talking more about applied potential tests when we get to those slides, but now let me explain a little bit here. The way that test is performed is by shorting all the high voltage bushings together and shorting all the low voltage bushings together, ground the low side, and energize single phase AC, the high side. So imagine it's Y connected and everything shorted together. The potential at the start and the finish of each winding on each phase will be the same. So if you're neutral, you wanted it to be grounded Y, that means the BIL level of that neutral is lower. So we have to apply the applied potential test level in correspondence to the weakest point. Now, if you want, you can want your high voltage Y connected transformer to have fully rated neutral as well. If that's the case, then the applied potential test is going to have to go with this column right here. Then in IEEE standards, as you see in this table, we actually have levels for induced voltage test, phase to ground. We'll talk a lot more about induced voltage test coming up. However, this is the basic. And where is the basic levels defined in the table here? And where do you find that? You can see that you find it in C57-1200 not 1290 and when you get the when you download the pdf version of this if you don't have these standards you can actually see all these uh, in front of you now we understood what is the class of a transformer and why it's important to know the classes from voltage point of view and from some of the test levels point of view so now let's start getting into routine and this design and other tests defined by our standards, C57-1200. Routine design and other tests shall be made in accordance with the requirements of table 17. And the sequence of tests, which we will share, is also defined. So what is a routine test? 
Routine tests shall be made on every transformer to verify that the product meets the design specifications. So you're buying a transformer and you actually don't have to specify your tests. We have to follow this. You can, and a lot of our customers do. You can ask for a lot of other tests than just routine tests. And uh, there's tables coming up that we'll be talking about that soon. But regardless, say that you didn't specify testing. You just said test per IEEE standard 1200 and 1290. Then the tables that we are going to be looking at uh, coming up shortly, it tells us, again, it also goes with the class of the transformer. So then with that class of the transformer, we look at what's routine tests defined by the standards, and we shall, must, perform those routine tests on every transformer as stated here. Design tests. Design tests shall be made on a transformer of new design to determine the adequacy of the design of a particular type, style, or model. Okay, so you buy a class one transformer, there's one test here in the table, it says design test. Okay, if our company or anybody you buy transformers from have already designed, built, and tested that design before, and you did not ask for it, we don't actually have to perform that test. However, if it is a brand new design that we haven't verified by performing the tests, then even though it's under design and you your spec didn't call for it, we still have to perform that design test if it's a new transformer. Okay? Other tests, when you see the table, some of these tests are actually considered other. What does that mean? The other tests are identified in individual product standards and maybe, may is a big word, may be specified by the purchaser in addition to routine tests. And it says right here in the parentheses, you may not be able to see it, it says impulse. So now you may say, how come lightning impulse is another test? It can be depending on the class, which you will see on this slide. Table 17, there's actually three or four slides on, on these tables. And these tables are where I'm going to spend some time because it's important for us to understand what is routine, what is design test, and also it's all the list right here. So I can get to talk about some of these tests, most of them, to a point, and then the rest of the slides have more details of these tests. Now, mostly I will be focusing on power transformers. So the columns that I'll be focusing will be class one power, and class two power transformers, okay? So let's make sure we understand how this table reads. These three columns right here under one group class one, routine, design, and other. Same thing for class two, routine, design, and other. So let's start with resistance measurements of all windings on rated voltage tap and at the tap extremes of the first unit of a new design. So for class one transformers, it's routine. For class two, it's routine only also. But pay attention. It says right here, of all windings on rated voltage tap and at the tap extremes of the first unit. So with this, even though it's routine, we don't really have, if it's a duplicate unit, duplicate design, we don't actually have to do DC resistance test, winding resistance test where it's very important because winding resistance test is done by using, I'll, I'll, I'll just focus on the new equipment, not the old methods, okay, with a DC resistance meter. Some of them now nowadays can circulate all the, all the way up to 100 amps, DC current. You energize, you inject the DC current, and there are potential leads that measures with the voltage drop gives you a resistance value, okay? It's important for us for many reasons. One, to calculate the I square R. Because when we do load loss test on a transformer, depending on the design, between 70 to 85, 90% of the load loss is from I square R. 
So we need to know the resistance value so we can calculate the R squared R. From that, we can calculate the ADN straight losses by subtracting the measured load loss and the I squared R. Now, ratio test on the rated voltage connection and on all tap positions as listed on the nameplate. It's routine. Regardless you ask for it or not, we must do, we shall do ratio tests routinely. Okay, polarity and phase relation test on the rated voltage connection. Now you may say, Hakan, if you're doing ratio, nowadays almost everybody does ratio tests with these new devices. Not that new, but ratio and phase relation is done simultaneously. Of course, that's correct. However, if any one of us are still using the old school methods of verifying the polarity and phase relation on a transformer, because you're not changing the phasing of a transformer, you need to verify the phasing really only just on one tap position. And it is routine. What's phasing? What's polarity? Let's take delta Y as an example, one of the most common phasing of transformers. Okay? One of the most common one is dy1, but does it have to be just dy1? No, it can be dy7. So it could be 180 degrees shifted, the low voltage, or that's what the phase relation is. How this test is performed is simple with these uh, new equipments. You connect the respectful high voltage test leads to high voltage bushings and the low voltage test leads on the low voltage bushings. And most importantly, you have to set that ratio meter up, whatever the nameplate polarity is. Is it DY1, DY5, DY11, YY0, YY6? One of the common ones. If you don't, if you just put the question mark on there and say, just test, give me a test result for a YY, and you may be expecting a YY0, but because you did not specify what the phasing you want the meter to test, and it could be accidentally connected as YY6. Trust me, mistakes do happen. Especially YY0 and YY6 is easy to mess. Okay? So I strongly recommend for those of you using these ratio meters to actually, when you're setting it up, to put the required vector group of the transformer so the meter can tell you if that is in sync with the phasing that it's measured. We're going to continue. Now remember, these columns, class one, class two, routine design other. No load loss and exciting current at 100% of rated voltage and at rated power frequency. No load loss. What does that mean? That is actually where we measure the losses accumulated from the core, from the flux running in the core, your core losses. And obviously it's routine for everything, all, all type of transformers, class of transformers. Now this one, next one, it says no load loss and exciting current at 110% of rated voltage and rated power. For distribution transformers, it's considered an other test. So other tests, it's not routine, it's not designed, in case if it's needed for distribution transformers, it can be asked. But pay attention for class one and class two. Power transformers performing 110% no load loss, core loss is routine test. We have to perform that test and we have to report that result to you because of all the harmonics and everything else that these transformers may be seen or, 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 or the uh, reverse power flow. Remember my presentation from several months ago about reverse power flow? You know, so transformers may see backfeeding over excitation. So we have to design, build, and test the transformers, power transformers, to withstand 110% over excited. Impedance. And by the way, before I get to impedance, how do we perform no load loss? No load loss test is performed by energizing the transformer open circuit, okay, at rated tap uh, connection. So for those of you who have been in transformer plants, witness testing or observing testing, 
you will see that 99% of the time, the test departments energize the transformer from the low voltage side, and they leave the high voltage side open, and they inject the required voltage to the transformer. <clears throat> but does it have to be injected just from the low voltage side? No. It can be injected from the high voltage side as well. It doesn't matter which side you come in. At the end, the core is common between the low and the high voltage line. Impedance voltage and load loss at rated current and rated frequency on the rated voltage connection and at the tap extremes of the first unit of a new design. First, let's talk about how do we do load loss and impedance test. Simulated loading. In our transformer plants, we don't actually have the actual load. So we have to simulate that load. That simulation of the load is done by shorting one of the windings. I'm specifically saying one of the windings, okay? I'm not saying shorting the low voltage winding, even though that is 99.9% .9 is the case that the test departments actually short the low voltage windings, bushings in this case, okay? And inject the current from the high voltage side. But once again, it doesn't have to be. Why we prefer to inject the current from the high voltage side by shorting the low voltage bushings together because the voltage required to circulate the rated current in the high voltage is called the impedance voltage. And it is a simple explanation of the rated voltage of the high voltage times the impedance value of the transformer. So if your transformer high voltage is 115 kV, and the impedance of the transformer is say 10%, then what we need is 11.5 kV to inject whatever the current that we need to inject. Okay, the setup is easier. Now, of course, <clears throat> because we are now, when we short the low voltage, we are pretty much taking the capacitance out of the circuit of the transformer. Otherwise, we cannot inject if we don't add external capacitors to the circuit. So there's actually capacitive load that we circulate. Otherwise, our test setups cannot circulate this current. Okay? So by this setup, we perform the test, we inject the current, and we take the measurements, applied voltage, applied current, and the losses measured on a three watt meter method. So from this data, we actually get the load loss, overall load loss. Remember what I said around five, six minutes ago? Load loss has two major components. The biggest one is the I square R. 80, 85% of the load loss is from I square R of the windings, from current flowing through the windings. The other is eddy and strays, tank losses, metal parts picking up these uh, leakage fluxes. Core clamps, some metal, they pick up those leaking fluxes and we actually measure them as part of the load loss itself. So now that's why it's important. Now we I have slides about temperature rise test, and the same slides I will be talking more about load loss because when we do load loss in our plants, the temperature reading all the DC, when we, did, when we do the winding resistance, the cold temperature reading, and when we do the load loss test, the temperature reading is very, very critical. Very critical. Because say that it's the, your, your liquid field transformer is at ambient temperature, okay? It's summertime now, let's say that the oil is at 26 degrees C. We inject the current, we take the measurements. What we get is the load losses at 25, 26 degrees C. But your transformer is 65 degree rise. So we have to take that losses and extrapolate, calculate it up to 85 degrees. Of course, it's not linear, but the cold temperature, the actual temperature that we say that 26 degrees will affect the result. If it was 26, we say, but if it wasn't, it was 32, your load loss, your final load loss result will differ. 
So it's very important how we take the cold temperature. And also, when you read our standards in detail, you will see there's actually time limits to do load losses at different temps. Because some of our customers require load losses to be performed at so many different tap positions and different MBAs. So we may be sitting there and injecting current in your windings for, I don't know, hour, two hours, three hours. Injecting current in the windings means that the windings are starting to warm up a little bit. So unless you have fiber optics directly in the windings, that little bit of heat starting to accumulate in your conductor isn't going to show up on your temperature gauge or your other RTDs, your probes. So the temperature again here, what you think it is when you do load loss tests may not be what it is. That's why there are actually time limitations and there are some times that we have to wait before we keep injecting these curves. And we'll talk about pass and fail criteria coming up shortly. Operation tests on all devices. Please pay attention for class one and class two power transformers, it is routine tests. All your other operational devices in your control cabinets, we have to test them to verify that they are functioning properly. Control auxiliaries, okay? Cooling consumption, please pay attention. For class one, it is considered other test. For class two, it is considered a routine test. Zero phase sequence impedance. So what zero phase sequence impedance? In a nutshell, the way I can explain zero phase sequence impedance is pretty much all windings impedance to ground, okay? Your leakage. For class one power transformers, it is considered a design test. So if we have done that on that design before, we don't, we don't have to routinely perform it on every unit. However, on class twos, it is considered a routine. And, and the, in the note section here, it's specified zero phase sequence impedance shall be performed when a neutral is brought out. This test is not applicable to single phase shell form or transformers with five legged cores. Why five legged cores? We can't because the, the, the leakage flux is not that anyway, not that much. Okay. Temperature rise test. Temperature rise test. At minimum and maximum ratings of the first unit or the first unit of a new design. For either class one or class two, it is considered a design test. So if you're buying class one or class two, or in this case, even for distribution transformers, if you want the plants, your supplier, to perform temperature rise tests on the transformer, you must specify it in your specification. Otherwise, especially companies like us, we've been designing building transformers over 50 years. I don't think there's actually one design left that we haven't done a temperature rise test on. So we don't have to do it. It is considered a, a, a design test. But if you specify, we have to follow your specifications first, okay? Next, temperature rise at minimum and maximum ratings when temperature rise tests are specified. Similar comments. DGA analysis. I'm not gonna talk about the DGA because I actually did a webinar just on DGA. If you would like a copy of that, please let our marketing department know and they'll be happy to share the presentation. But let's look at if DGA is routine or design or other. For class one transformers, it's considered other. So if you buy a 45 kV 10 MVA unit and you do not ask for DGA analysis, we don't have to do it. We do it anyway, of course, because it is for our quality control purposes. We have to know. We take at least before and after all test uh, dissolved gas samples. We must know. But per the standards for that class unit, it is not a routine test. However, for class two transformers, it is a routine test. So whoever your supplier is, if the transformer is 69 kV, 25 MeA, whatever the class two definition we talked about, 
the DGA for class two is routine. At minimum, let's read that, as a minimum, dissolve or in oil analysis shall be performed in oil samples drawn before the start of all tests and after completion of all tests, at minimum. So your cluster transformer you bought, you forgot to put in your spec, and it's a class two, that has to be at least two DGA results attached with the certified test board. And of course, pass and fail criteria and all that for DGA is in my other webinar that you can get copies. Sound level, audible sound level test. Now for class one, it's not a mistake. We didn't do it mistakenly here. It's it's considered design and other. And for class two, it's considered design and other also. Now there's a section for audible sound, very, very detailed uh, in 1290 and also 1200. Okay. But what is sound level test? Well, we all know transformers hum in the field when they're energized, right? So there's limits defined by the standards. We need to perform the test to make sure with or without the fence or with or without the pumps. However, the cooling is all in transformer or maybe there may be no cooling, just radiators or nothing else. We need to test the sound level, make sure it meets the requirements. And once again, uh, there's in under 1200 section 8.2.5 has more details and of course under 1290 uh, i think the the latest revision of sound level is like three four pages so please i encourage everyone to read it the main source of sound in a transformer is the core but larger the transformers you actually can get noise from the load as well from the current flowing in the windings as well so these sections are updated. New release uh, 21, uh, C57 1290 has very details also on how to perform to this. But just for today's sake, the easiest way for me to explain how to perform basic sound level tests on a transformer, uh, for a smaller transformer, you energize it under no load, okay? And you walk around everyone, you stay one foot every, one meter, you take readings, depend on the height of the transformer, one third and two thirds of the height with high accuracy noise meters. You take the readings and you take the ambient reading. That's pretty much how you perform the test. Now, what happens if, say, calculated noise level or guaranteed noise level versus the measured noise level? Say, calculated is 64 dBs and we are measuring 75. What may that mean? Well, that may mean a lot. Uh, it may be design issue. Maybe we didn't design it right. Maybe we accidentally used different uh, incorrect core material. Because for this size transformer, I just used the example. Let's say that we are just focusing on the core noise, not the load noise. Okay? It has happened. Or even sometimes even supplier might have accidentally shipped the wrong grade core steel, not the thickness. Okay? Uh, so the other thing, maybe due to manufacturing. Remember those of you who attend my webinars continuously, I always say any transformer, that three-legged stool, everything has to be perfectly balanced, design, material, and manufacturing practices, processes, it applies. It's not magic. If it's not the design, it could be the material. If it's neither one of them, it could be manufacturing. These cores, core steel, when they are stacked, they have to be tightened. The core clamps, the lock strips, the, the, all that structure we do to, to put everything together, to hold everything together, the core clamp structure, the clamping structure is not just to hold the coils under pressure. It is, of course, but also to really hold the core under pressure. Remember, when a transformer is energized, the core turns into a giant magnet. That's how the transformer works. Short circuit capability, okay? I do wanna mention here about the distribution transformers. It is actually considered a design test for a new design. So if you're buying a distribution transformer and it is a new design from your supplier, 
they need to do a short circuit test. For class one and class two, they are considered othered. For those of you who may not be familiar with short circuit tests, that is actually the test that there's only one laboratory in our country who can do this test. Uh, test departments, your suppliers, us, we, we, don't, we cannot do short circuit tests because that's, where, that's the test that we actually simulate fault on a transform. So the generator that, that's used to simulate that boom uh, injection or sudden injection of that uh, fault current. Remember, the fault current is in reverse uh, of the impedance of the rated winding. So if you're uh, rated current of the winding, so if you're, say, low voltage winding is rated for, say, 4,000 amps, and your impedance is 10%, that seven cycle, 10 cycle, whatever, all the short circuit we have, they have to inject 40,000 amps in those little cycles. So it's, it's very, 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 that's why it, it's not, as, as the note states here, testing of large transformers may not be practical because of the test facility limitations. Because it, it requires a huge energy source to be able to inject such fault currents, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to quickly go through these. Winding insulation resistance. A lot of people call it mega test. It's not mega test. It's winding insulation resistance test. It's routine. Core insulation is routine for class one and class two. Partial discharge test for core gassing. For class one transformers, it is routine. For class two, it's not even applicable. It's not partial discharge that is you think that we will be talking about. Okay, it's for core gas. Insulation power factor test. Routine for both class one and class two transforms. And for those of you who may say, Akan, you're just speaking about this and not talking about the testing. I have a lot more slides coming up that we will be talking about some of these tests in more detail, which is why now that I'm looking at my watch, we are definitely going to have a part two of this session in July because I think these, these topics are important. So we are going to have the detail of these test slides following up in July. Single phase excitation for class one transformer is considered for both one and two is considered other. Let's look at lightning impulse. For class one transformers, it is not routine test, okay? So if you buy a 45 kV 10 MeA unit, we don't have to do, if we have done it on a, on a uh, design before of that, we don't have to do lightning impulse test as a routine. You can ask for it, but for class two, it's a routine test. Switching impulse, okay? I do want to read that switching impulse for class one transformers is considered other, but for class two, it's routine and other. So let's read what that means. Switching impulse tests are routine for transformers with high voltage windings operating at 345 kV and above. That's why it's routine and other. So if your class two transformer is say 230 kV, okay, it is not routine. But if it's 345 and above, it is routine. And we'll talk about what switching search impulse test is and all that stuff uh, in, in, in our part two of this webinar series. And partial discharge for class one. The actual partial discharge test for class one is considered other. For class two, it is considered routine. This test, I mean, there's many other reasons behind it, but this test was one of the reasons why at IEEE Transformers Committee, we changed the class defini the definition and edit that 69 kV between 69 and 115 up to uh, 15 MVA rating so that partial discharge becomes routine test for those size transformers, okay? Okay, so, uh, I believe that table, understanding that table, understanding some of the tests uh, right after we, we speak about the class of the transformers was important. 
Uh, now we are going to start getting into some details of these testing tolerances. You may be some some of you may be thinking that every test, especially every routine test we do, should have a tolerance defined in the IEEE standards. Well, most of them, not every one of them. Don't be surprised. So we will see. We'll see what these are. We'll talk about some of them today. And whatever is left, we'll talk about it in session two in July. And by the way, the session two in July, uh, we will make sure that we leave at least 20 minutes for Q&A. OK? So if you're in the session today, I strongly encourage you all to try to attend to session two also in July, part two of the same topic. Tolerance for ratio. The turns ratio, remember, turns ratio, how it's performed, meter, high side leads, low side leads, you set up the phasing, you energize it, okay? And you actually input the nameplate voltages for high side and low side for each tap. Brrr, the meter runs and it gives you results and it actually gives you a percent uh, difference. So as of right now, the tolerance for ratio why am I saying as of right now? Because at the Transformers Committee, we are working on changing this. And I'll explain to those of you who are interested why. As of right now, the pass and fail criteria is calculated value using the nameplate voltages, measured value, if it is within 0.5%, life is good. Your ratio test pass. Okay? But what if? Because ratio, after all, if you just think about a simple transformer, High side, low side, nothing else. Let's just focus on simple things first, right? Three phase transformer. There are number of turns on the high side, number of turns on the low side. Okay, mistakes are humanly. We all make them. So if we go by this, your A phase, what if your A phase ratio error is minus 0.3%? Your B phase ratio error is plus 0.3%. If we don't do anything to the standards right now, it's acceptable it passes the test. Okay? But if you look at it, this one is minus 0.3, this one is plus 0.3. So between phase to phase ratio error is 0.6%. Now, we are arguing a lot. That's what we do in our triple transformers community. We just argue. All right? So what does it do to a transformer? What if it's like that? Does it do anything bad, good, not? We'll see. But this tolerance, as it is written right now, is 0.5% to the calculated nameplate value. OK? Tolerance for impedance from C57 to F100, section 9.2. The impedance of a two-winding transformer with an impedance greater than 2.5% shall have a tolerance of 7.5%, okay? So if you want your impedance to be 10%, we can go about unless otherwise specified. Now for those impedance values less than 2.5%, then the tolerance is 10%. The difference, this is an important one, this paragraph right here, the differences of impedances between duplicate two winding transformers when two or more units are given rating are produced by one manufacturer at the same time. The difference between transformers, duplicate transformers. So you give us an order for 10 transformers and you want to produce and ship back to back. Okay? Each transformer has a 7.5% tolerance to it. However, in addition to that, because they're all produced within the same time, they're all identical units, impedance to impedance to impedance of each transformer has to be within 7.5% as well. It's really for paralleling purposes. B, impedance of a transformer having three or more windings or having zigzag windings shall have a tolerance of 10% of the specified value. Differences between duplicate three winding zigzag transformers also has to be within 10%. And it goes like that. Remember how we do impedance test? It's just like the load loss test by shorting one of the windings, all bushings, and injecting the current from the other one. 
And with that, you measure not only the impedance, but also the load loss of the transformer as well. Tolerances for losses. As I said before, there are two major losses on transformers. Okay? No load losses, which are the losses coming from the core, and load losses, which are the losses coming from the current flowing in your windings, your leads, and also it's picking up those ADN strays and tank losses. Unless otherwise specified, it's very important. You can specify your tolerances. If you look at any of any of our test reports, certified test reports, we actually say at the bottom that we certify that this transformer meets all customer specifications and IEEE la 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 standards. So we have to follow your standards first. But if you don't specify, the tolerances read like this. The no load loss of a transformer shall not exceed the specified no load losses by no more than 10%. So there is actually a tolerance value for no load loss. But then there is really not a tolerance value for load loss. What there is, as it reads here, 10% for no load and total losses of a transformer shall not exceed the specified total losses by more than 6%. Okay, so we build a transformer, we measure no load. Okay, and no load is 9% higher than what we guaranteed. Unless otherwise specified, you may specify your no load losses to be max. Okay, you can specify whatever. But if you didn't, we follow this and we say, okay, no load is 6%. Then you look at load loss. You don't look at load loss, you add the load and the no load together. And that needs to be within 6% of the guaranteed value. Dielectric tests. So we're going to talk a lot about dielectric tests in part two of this uh, webinar in July, mid-July. <clears throat> the test sequence. We used to receive these questions, for those of you who might not be really familiar, what test do you do when it comes to, what? first of all, let's talk about dielectric tests. Are these the only dielectric tests? Lightning impulse, switching impulse, applied potential, induced potential? No. Dielectric test also includes insulation power factor, insulation winding, core insulation resistance. You know, these are all part of dielectric tests. But these are the high stress dielectric tests. And it is important that we do these tests per the sequence defined by our standards under C527290. So if we have to do switching tests on a transformer and we have to do lightning tests per your spec or per the classes that we talked about, the lightning impulse has to be done first. Then we have to do switching, then applied, then induced. Pay attention, it's not saying partial discharge. Because when we talk about each of these, here I have detailed slides, okay, that we will talk. And while I'm talking, that I'll be talking about the case studies also, which are not in the, in the presentation, okay? But I'm going to be talking about them in part two. So make sure you attend part two, okay? But important thing is for us to follow this sequence. And you may say, Hakan, how come? Insulation power factor is not listed here since it's a dielectric. Well, in insulation power factor is more of the quality control. And we do it even before we do a lot of these tests. Just to make sure that the transformer is in a good, dry, whatever condition it is before we actually start applying these high energies. Okay? And it says here, by agreement between the manufacturer and purchaser, switching impulse tests, when required, may be performed before lightning impulse test. Why did we put that <clears throat> in, the, in the standards? Okay? Because of the setups. There is not a lightning impulse generator and there is not a switching impulse generator. There's only one generator. Okay? And... If you buy, if you buy a, a very large transformer, high BIL, those of you who've been in those test laboratories, you, you've seen those giant towers. So switching that giant tower setup from switching to lightning may take hours. So if you go to a plant 
and they had just finished doing switching on another unit and they are now ready to do high voltage dielectric tests on your transformers, they may ask your permission to do switching before lighting so that they don't spend all that three, four, five, whatever hours it takes to change the setup. That's why we, we, we put that in the standards. You can agree and say, okay, I'm okay. You can do switching before lighting. Temperature, this is not temperature rise test. It's not the temperature during the electric test may be made, maybe made at temperatures assumed under normal conditions or at the temperatures attained under conditions of routine test. What that means is we, we get these uh, requirements from our customers. They say, say that we don't do a temperature rise test on a unit, but we have to do these dielectric tests. So your transformer, while we are doing these tests, will be at whatever the ambient temperature is. Today in our plant, ambient temperature is around 22 degrees C. So however, your transformer, when it's running normal in the, in, in, in the field, will be 85 degrees C. So with this temperature, you have a right to ask your supplier to heat the transformer up and get it close to 80, 85 degrees and immediately perform the dielectric test. So you can simulate the actual stress conditions that this transformer is going to see in the field. Because higher the temperature, slightly less the dielectric strength of the oil and the insulation. That's why we put it there in the standards. Switching impulse failure detection. So what I'm going to do, we only have two minutes left. I am actually going to pause part one at this slide. Because after this, we are going to get into the very details of some of these tests, which are switching, lightning, lightning impulse test sequence, I'm going to talk about these graphs, how to actually look at these lightning and pass and fail criteria. One of the hardest ones to understand is, is the lightning impulse, because not every dielectric test is an obvious boom or not. It's, it's overlay that really experience counts also. So we're going to be talking about lightning impulse tests very detailed in part two in July. As you can see, failure detections. We're going to talk about applied potential test, and we're going to talk about induced potential for class one. Some of you may know it's, you, you know, some of us call it double induction test. And we are going to talk about induced potential with partial discharge readings for class two. And some of the readings, what they mean. You do partial discharge, guaranteed level is this, and we are measuring slightly with this. Now let's go look at the needle in a haystack. That's pretty much what the test guys say, right? The PD is slightly higher. So these are the slides that I'll be talking about the uh, case studies and some of the experience that I had in my career. And partial discharge, LTC positions. I specifically put this in the slides because it's important for you also to know, as well as we, to know what tap positions we have to do PD at. We'll talk about partial discharge. We'll talk about very detail about temperature rise test. Because remember, number one killer of a transformer is temperature. So we have those slides coming up in part two and insulation power factor. I do want to talk about that more detail and I'm going to talk about it in part two in July. So having said that, I'm looking forward to seeing, not seeing, having you on our next webinar in part two in July. Please look for the invitations. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions you want to ask for us to really look at in part two, because I am purposely going to leave close to th 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A in July, you can either email me or our marketing department, marketing at vatransformer.com, or my email is hakan.sahin at gatransformer.com. Either or Shoot us emails and we'll be ready and we will hopefully uh, speak with you again sometime in mid-July. Thank you very much for your time.